Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, last uh, and best speech for this year. This is a, a wonderful research lecture by our own dear Dr. Mirva Tibai. I'm so glad that you will be concluding our very successful lecture series for this semester. Thank you for all the internal attendees and the external at attendees for joining us. Um, I'm not going to speak for long. Uh, but I'm going to say that this is going to be a fascinating talk because it's going to be a summary of a series of studies that the lab of Dr. Sibai has undertaken that investigate uh, si signal transduction pathways that lead to cancer cell migration and invasion. Hot off the press research, very timely, very topical, uh, very much needed. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, and we're all quite eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Dean Jainete. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my PowerPoint at this time. Uh, can we see it? Can you see it? Uh, it? It needs a minute. Not yet. Isabel, welcome. Thank you, Doctor. So nice to see you. Too oh, dear. Hi, Doctor Wax. Either do you see it? Yes, yes, we can see it. And fantastic. Okay, great. Okay, wonderful. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, as the title says, uh, today I'm going to talk about a, a series of stories pretty much describing uh, signal transduction and signaling stories at the leading edge of cancer cells undergoing migration. So like I said, these are, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't really go too technical uh, because I know that, uh, you know, I'm speaking to people from various backgrounds. So I didn't go too technical in the field of cell migration or actin or cancer metastasis. Uh, so I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is just to summarize, leaving out a lot of the data really, but I'm always happy to further discuss uh, further data with you if needed or if anyone is interested. So let me begin with a very quick introduction of cancer. What is cancer in general? And, and uh, uh, another disclaimers that as, I, as I'm going to be presenting my data, I'm going to be presenting data from various tumors, various uh, cancer models, not necessarily with one uh, uh, specific type of cancer. And as I show the data, I will point out which type of cancer the study was done in. So what is cancer? Uh, in its most, uh, you know, um, uh, simple description, cancer is a group of cells that go crazy, that uh, become completely individualistic, completely selfish, as I usually call them in my classes. Uh, they stop being communal. They stop being about the, you know, the, the uh, metabolic activity or the function or the tissue or the organism as a whole. They undergo uncontrollable uh, replication and their main function would be then to keep on replicating, making more of themselves. And it's still really clinically acceptable that the main distinction between what benign tumor would be and what cancer is, is metastasis. So in most types of tumors, with very few exceptions, such as brain cancer, in most types of tumors, the tumor would still be manageable if it's still encapsulated, if it's still in one area, in one organ, where it can actually be handled surgically. The problem arises when tumors become metastatic and when tumors metastasize or invade, this is when we actually by definition or the clinical definition for it becomes that the tumor became 
uh, malignant, and this is where in most cases, unfortunately, it becomes terminal. So for us, it was always of interest to study cancer metastasis in the lab, trying to... So it's always been uh, of a lot of interest to study cancer metastasis. So like I said, uh, of the many hallmarks of cancer that the cells will have uh, sustained proliferative uh, signaling, they will evade growth suppressors, they will resist cell death, uh, unlike normal cells, but more importantly, they will undergo invasion and metastasis. We have many more other hallmarks of cancer, a lot of which we have been really studying in the lab, but today I'm mostly focused on invasion on, and metastasis of cancer cells. So what is metastasis? Metastasis, you can see this video right here on the right hand side. This is a video that was done in animals. It's a technique called multi-photon. We don't really have it in Lebanon yet. So these are fluorescently tagged cancer cells undergoing metastasis inside the animal. So what you do is that you anesthetize a whole rat and you just stick it under the microscope and you image it and you can actually observe cancer cells undergoing uh, migration. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and share a couple of movies with you that I really wanted you to see. I couldn't embed these um, in the PowerPoint. So let me show you these couple of movie movies. These were also done um, using multi-photon. Just one second, let me play. I apologize about that. Let me play the movie first. So here we go. Um, right. So um, these are a couple of movies also showing cancer cells. The dark stuff that you see are vessels. So you can see the cancer cells undergoing metastasis inside the animal. So this kind of technology is really quite amazing because it enables us to observe um, this phenomenon inside the live animals. So it enables us to see the environment, the 3D environment and what's really going on. But at the same time, it's what we call an end result kind of assay because you can either see it or not see it, but you can't really do high resolution studies to really understand what the cells are doing, what the cancer cells are doing and the kind of proteins that come into play. Now to go back, Back to the idea of metastasis, what is metastasis? It's the encapsulated tumor, pretty much breaking uh, down the environment, breaking the basal lamina, escaping from the what we call the primary location, and then going into the blood vessels through a step that we call intravasation. The cancer cells would then travel to remote location in the blood, and then they undergo a uh, following that a step that we call extravasation, where they will actually escape the blood, and then they will um, uh, form a new tumor, a secondary tumor in a distal uh, site. And again, this is where it becomes problematic because many tumors can uh, metastasize and invade in many organs. And whenever we have uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, invasion or metastasis throughout the body is when a patient would have what we call, you know, uh, uh, the surgery would be impossible because the patient would undergo multiple organ uh, failure. So this is the very terminal, very uh, difficult step of cancer that again would define uh, a malignant cancer as opposed to a, a benign tumor. So for us to really study metastasis, we need to study something that we call cancer cell migration or cell migration in general. Um, all right, so what is cell migration? Here in this slide, I'm showing you several examples of cell migration. Right here, if you can look at the upper left, you can see macrophages following this bacterial cell and they're very diligent. They follow cues given to them by the bacterial cells and finally they just swallowed the bacterial cell. So migration is a very important physiological process that our cells need. It's needed for our immune system. You see another example here. This is the bloodstream and these are neutrophils and other you know, macrophages, a lot of immune cells. You can see them here that are going to the site of a wound healing. Here also you can see an example of 
uh, migration in prokaryotes. So cell migration uh, in general is an important physiological process, but it needs to be highly regulated because it shouldn't be uh, happening all the time and it should only should only happen when it's actually relevant. So for em embryogenesis, for wound healing, um, for uh, phagocytosis, for the immune response. Now, it becomes really problematic when cancer cells undergo uh, migration. And you can see cancer cell, examples of cancer cells undergoing migration in the movies I'm pointing out here. Um, so cancer cells actually can, uh, again, escape the primary location of the tum tumor and go to distant locations. And something that's noteworthy is that cancer cells do not really reinvent the wheel. So this is a, the thing that we need to understand about cancers. They don't really, you know, just pick up and leave or pick up and walk by, uh, um, you know, using novel proteins or novel processes. What cancer cells do is that they hijack the normal processes that cells have, but through this regulation, they would actually uh, use it at all times or use it when it's uh, inappropriate. So when it comes to the cancer cell motility cycle through several studies over the years, over the past 50 years or so, by now we really quite understand um, the cycle of uh, migration or the cycle of um, cancer cell motility. And this cycle always starts with receiving a signal this signal we call it chemoattractant, so the cells will receive uh, initially, I'm sorry, I, I'm just having a trouble uh, shifting between slides. So the cells will receive an initial signal that will tell them where to go. That initial response is to emit what we call a protrusion or lamellopod, which will define the direction of migration. For the cells to be able to have a productive migration, they need to fix this protrusion to the extracellular matrix, so they need to adhere to the external environment. After that, the cells need to contract their body to finally detach at the tail, decontract, to be able to literally move, to literally undergo walking. And to do so, really cells depend on actin polymerization. So cell motility depends on the rearrangement of the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, you can see it in this movie here with cells that undergo, I'm sorry, with cells that are uh, emitting, well, it won't stop, it won't start, with cells that uh, 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 emit a protrusion, okay? Um, you can see it here with this electron micrograph. Uh, these electron micrographs show this, uh, 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 the actin polymerization or the network of actin that the cells have to emit for them to create the lamellopodia for them to be able to move uh, forward. And uh, in way of animation or a model, we know today that we have pre-existing actin filaments and for the cells to emit this protrusion that we've seen, uh, they rely on a complex of proteins. Just be mindful of this guy in blue right here. I'm going to go back and talk about it. Uh, so they have a complex of proteins that would go and attach itself to what we call the mother filament. Um, after attaching, it can then import additional actin monomers that will keep on adding in a branched manner to the existing mother filament. Uh, in order to create this branch network. So this is pretty much the model that we have put together again through many years of studying this process. We know that, again, we have a pre-existing mother filament. Uh, the blue guy I told you about is a protein called ARP23. So it's a protein that we call an actin nucleator. It actually, when you look at the crystal structure of ARP23, it's so cute that it actually mimics an actin monomer. So it will encourage actin nucleation by binding here, mimicking an actin nucleus, and onto it, uh, additional actin monomers will then um, attach. And this will lead to this branch network that I showed you earlier uh, through the electron micrograph, which is needed for the structure of the protrusion and for the cells to protrude and to then uh, move forward. Now, knowing that ARP23 plays this role, we then, and um, for years in my lab, we've been interested in a family of proteins called the rho-GTPases. I'm going to point your attention to three main proteins under 
the raw GTP is called raw A, RAG, and CDC42. And why these proteins? Because um, raw GTP users, through uh, all their studies where they use dominant negatives to inhibit these proteins, these proteins have been shown to have uh, an effect on um, many actin structures in the cells, including uh, structures called philopodia, uh, lamellopodia, which is the protrusion I told you about, and the cess fibers, which are uh, the contractile force of the cells. And we know this because we know the downstream effectors from these raw GTPases. So again, for RAC1, we know that RAC1 activates a protein called WAVE, which leads to the activation of ARP23, that blue guy I told you about, which will polymerize actin. So whenever RAC1 is active, it will actually lead to the protrusion, to the lamellopodia formation, finally leading to cancer cell migration. Similarly to RAC, another protein called CDC42, will also activate a protein called WASP, which is a, this, a, a very close relative of WAVE, so they belong to the same family. When uh, WASP binds CDC42, it will open up, exposing an actin binding site, and then it will import actin monomers and start the polymerization and the formation of the network we've seen before. And finally, another favorite protein in my lab is a protein called ROA, and Rho A historically has been known to be involved in contractility, contraction, cess fiber formation, and the formation of adhesion structures, because we know the downstream effectors from Rho A will lead to actomycin contractility without going into the details of that uh, pathway as well. So really just, you know, if, if you look at the side effects or the phenotype of cells, or if you stain for these proteins, you'll see that they localize to the site of their suspected activity. Now in our lab and with time over years, we became to understand more and more in the field that uh, nothing's really that linear in signal transduction and in cell biology. And today we understand that most signal transduction pathways crosstalk. And we understand more and more about the crosstalk of raw GTPases. So knowing that all of these proteins really affect each other and speak to each other and feed into each other, we were interested, again, to take a second look at CDC42, which in the past, the role of CDC42 has been uh, described as limited to the formation of structures called philopodia, uh, which, uh, so this, uh, this is how philopodia look like. These are small spikes at the surface of cells uh, that are, uh, we think they play a role in uh, mechanosensing, in the cell sensing where they're going. Uh, but we really had a sneaking suspicion that CDC42 might have a bigger role to play in uh, cell migration in general and in cancer cell migration in particular. Uh, we began this work by obtaining a what we call a biosensor, a ratiometric biosensor. This was developed by a brilliant chemist called Perry Nalbent. She published this in Science. Um, what she did is that she worked on a, a biosensor uh, that uh, recognizes when endogenous CDC42 is active. Because the way it works is that when CDC42 is active, it will bind to its downstream effector, the protein called WASP. And when both are bound to each other, they will create a hydrophobic pocket. So what Perry did is that she conjugated, she added an inorganic dye that is what we call a solvatochromatic dye, meaning when the environment is hydrophobic, the dye will actually increase in its fluorescent intensity. So it follows that whenever CDC42 is active, is uh, so when it's in the inactive form, it won't bind to its downstream effector. So the dye is still exposed, it's, it has low intensity. And when CDC42 is active, we, uh, uh, after adding uh, the, the, the downstream effector that's conjugated to the dye, CDC42 will now bind to it, and this will lead to an increase in intensity, to an increase in fluorescence that we can then observe under microscopy. We also uh, uh, normalize it to the total expression, and we obtain what we call ratiometric images. So the images here, and you see the pseudo color, uh, reflect on the activation of CDC42. So whenever you see red or white, this is where we have 
areas of high CDC42 activity. So just by looking at where CDC42 is active, and uh, this is this is in breast cancer cells, and these breast cancer cells stimulated with the growth factor, we saw that CDC42, the activation of it indeed localizes to the edge of the cells. And also just by doing immunostaining using a, an anti-CDC42 antibody, as you can see in this image here, and many other images that were collected, and by uh, using a macro uh, where we can trace the cells, uh, you can see in this animation here, we trace the cells and the macro will then uh, go 0.22 microns uh, uh, inside the cells to measure the collective fluorescent intensity, then when we graph this uh, by time of stimulation and by uh, distance from the edge of the cells, we saw that CDC42 localizes to the edge of these cells. So, it's you know, CDC42 localizes to the edge, it's active at the edge, fine, that's great, but so far it really is in line with what we thought about CDC42, that it has a role and the formation of philopodia. So after that, we wanted to look at the direct effect of CDC42. And the only way to look at the direct effect of proteins is by inhibiting proteins, or in this case, we knock down CDC42. And uh, we looked at how the cells migrate, these breast cancer cells, how they undergo random migration in serum. So these are time-lapse microscopy movies for two hours. So you, you, you're looking at frames that are one minute uh, apart. And you, these are luciferase cells with the control. And these are cells where CDC42 was knocked down. And you see a dramatic difference in the migration um, of the cells where CDC42 was knocked down. This was also quantitative. Uh, besides that, so CDC42 uh, is needed for cancer cells to migrate. So CDC42 is a, a positive regulator of cell migration. Uh, when we also looked at the mechanism behind that, when we looked at the protrusion of these cancer cells using uh, chymographs, we saw how the cells were really stop protruding when CDC42 is knocked down. Besides that, when we looked at the protrusion be, uh, uh, beyond uh, adhesion structures, we saw that you can see the, you know, the phenotype, the difference in the phenotype, again, between luciferase cells and CDC42 knockdown, and a technique we, uh, we call uh, interference reflection microscopy, which looks at sites of adhesion to the extracellular matrix. So this protrusion, this healthy protrusion, goes beyond the adhesion structures, but when you look at the adhesion structures in CDC42 knockdown cells, they're right at the edge, which means we lost the protrusion. Uh, we also did some electron uh, micrographs. This was done in uh, Einstein, actually. We don't have an electron micro, uh, uh, microscope in Lebanon in general, so this was done abroad. So again, when you look at the control cells versus cells where we uh, inhibit or knock down CDC42, we completely lose that branched network, which we have it uh, characterized. We can characterize this network of actin filaments by measuring the angles of the actin filaments. And just by measuring the angles, we can actually see that we lose this um, uh, lamellopodia that we call it, this you know protrusion, and this cells where CDC42 was knocked down right at the edge of these cells, they only have a structure that we call the lamella. And let me show you what that means. So when you uh, stimulate the cells with the growth factor as they are ready to migrate, they have this area of uh, actin branched network, which is full of our, you know, that blue protein I talked about, ARP2-3. Um, so, you know, they're protruding, actin is branching, the cells are emitting this protrusion so that they can walk forward. Right behind this area, is an area that we call the lamella, which is where the cell adheres to the extracellular matrix. It's important to know this for the next part of the uh, of the talk. So we completely lost this area, which is very well characterized, again, as I said, by the angles of the actin filaments. We lost this area uh, also when we stain for R23, that, you know, our favorite protein, which leads to branching, we, uh, uh, we can see that in control cells, ARP23 will go to that area, the lamellopodia. So in very high resolution, you can see ARP23 localizing to that one micron thick uh, 
area called the lamellar podia and also by you know quantitation within one micron you can see the increase in the intensity of r23 in that area as opposed to that when we knock down cdc42 there's complete lack of r23 localization to this distinct distinct um, area okay so putting all of this together this is, you know, uh, um, one quick part of the study, just to very quickly talk about the role of CDC 42. We have a working model where we today we think that CDC 42 is at the center, leading to uh, the activation of R23 through intermediary uh, proteins that we also looked at and studied. And we think that CDC 42 is doing so mostly through uh, activating RAC downstream from it. And since then, we've done a lot more studies in other tumor types. This was done in ovarian cancer, where we showed that CDC42 is needed for RAC activation. This is a technique called pull-down assay, which looks at the activation of rho GTPases. Here, we're looking at the activation of RAC. And if you look at the first two lanes, you can see that um, RAC activation goes down when SKOV3 cells, which are ovarian cancer cells, um, were transfected with CDC42 sRNA to knock down CDC42. We've done that in astrocytoma as well. Uh, we've done that as well uh, using a, um, a biosensor that reflects on uh, the activation of CDC42 to show that CDC42 goes to the edge and lung cancer cells as well, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. So in that first uh, step for cancer cell migration that I talked to you about, which is emitting a protrusion during the cancer cell migration cycle, CDC42 was found to be central in that role. Now switching gear from CDC42 to another protein, which is rho A, also based on the historical characterization of rho A or what role we know of rho A or its downstream effectors, we used to think that rho A mostly or only leads to the formation of focal adhesions, these adhesion structures that allow cells to adhere to the extracellular matrix. And based on that, the field really for the longest time placed rho A or assumed that rho A would be at the tail so we call it the leading edge and the tail of cancer cells migrating or polarizing in this 2D um, direction. So rho A has been always placed at the tail of cancer cells. But with advances in the field, we then understood that as the cell emits its, its protrusion, it needs to fix it to the extracellular matrix so that it can leverage this contractility and push itself or pull itself forward. Uh, this is one thing. Besides that, since then, we uh, uh, a protein called MDA has been discovered, which is a downstream effective from rho A as well. And MDA is also an actin nucleator similar to R23. So based on all of these new discoveries, we wanted to revisit uh, the potential role of rho A in cancer cell migration. So is it really just at the tail of cancer cells undergoing migration? Or is it also at the leading edge where the cells need to fix themselves to the extracellular matrix? So we use a technique called FRET, forced resonance energy transfer. These are biosensors that are usually produced in the labs of uh, collaborators. Uh, the first one I talked about, uh, developed by Perrin Albent, was uh, published in Science. Uh, this biosensor was published in Nature. It was developed by a guy called uh, Olivier Pertz. Um, and uh, it was developed in the lab of Klaus Hahn uh, in North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Besides Olivier, another guy in uh, Klaus Hahn's lab was called, uh, it's called uh, Louis Hodgson, who is currently still our collaborator and sends us a lot of biosensors. And I'd like to tell you at this point that Maria Haddad, who's with us in the audience, uh, she went to Louis Hodgson's lab for an internship and then finally, she's in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in a rotating Klaus Hans lab. So the connectivity had uh, remained with these guys who uh, gave us all of these biosensors. We still work with them. Maria was the first one to establish the biosensor work in my lab uh, a few years ago. 
And this uh, slide is stolen from Maria, actually. She prepared this slide. Uh, so the way FRET works is that uh, it's an actual rad radiationless uh, fluorescent transfer between one fluorophore to another. And we use what we call a good uh, fluorescent pair or a fluorophore pair. Uh, our go-to uh, fluorophore pair in my lab are CFP and YFP. So the way it works is that, as we know, when we excite a fluorophore, uh, the electrons will go to the excited state, and as they relax back down, as the as the electrons relax relax back down, uh, there's a transfer, there's a photon that's emitted that's going to be transferred to the next uh, fluorophore, which is YFP in this case, which we call the acceptor, which will then lead to the excitation of electrons, and the photon that will uh, be then emitted will be emitted by YFP. So it's kind of a um, a transition of energy between CFP and YFP. So what we do at the microscope is that we use a, a filter cube where we excite CFP and detect the emission by YFP. Now, why, why is this um, relevant? Because what we do is that um, we conjugate these two fluorophores to two proteins to see if the two proteins are binding to each other. Because for threat to occur, for this uh, exchange to happen, the two fluorophores need to be within 50 angstrom from each other. But we actually use that uh, for our advantage in order to develop biosensors that use, instead of two random proteins, that uses our protein of interest and then the uh, binding domain for that protein from its downstream effector. So only when rho A is active, it will bind to rho binding domain, okay? So when rho A is not active, it will not bind to rho binding domain, which will keep CFP and YFP away from each other, so we don't have a flat signal. When rho is active, it will bind to the rho binding domain, bringing these two within 50 angstrom from each other, bringing the two fluorophores close to each other and leading to a flat signal. So this again was used by us in this uh, 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 you know, using live microscopy as well, which we were the first ones among a few doing live threat uh, imaging in cancer cells. So we did that to look at the activation of rho in live cells undergoing random migration. And we could see that rho is active at what looked like a protrusion of these cells. When we did a much higher resolution analysis, besides the time lapse, we could see that rho localizes or the activation of rho seems to be slightly behind that one micron area I talked to you about before, or that lamellopodia. So this, the localization is indicative of a potential localization to the lamellar area or the area right behind the lamellopod where the adhesion structures are. Uh, in addition to that, we used inhibitors for uh, the rho pathway and uh, the rock downstream from rho. And we saw that rho is actually needed for the cancer cells to undergo migration as well. So when you inhibit rho, cancer cells completely lose their migration. We were able to quantitate this as well. And at the same time, we were able to mimic that when we transfected the cells with a constitutively active rack construct. So, to put everything together, and then I'm going to uh, uh, take it back to adhesion, it seems that when we have an increase in RAC, which was due to raw inhibition, the cells look like what we, we call them couch potato in the lab. They round it up, uh, they start going in all directions in a way that they are completely paralyzed, and they adopted how normal cells need to look like. So, this is normal epithelial cells as opposed to when we have an increase in rho, which was basically what cancer cells had to begin with, the cells became polarized and they became very mobile and they adopted this cancer morphology. So these are our epithelial cells that went from normal to cancer-like due to this increase in rho, which we showed in the lab that it's actually oncogenic and it's not limited to the tail of cells, it's needed for uh, to fix that cell uh, protrusion, so it's needed for cell migration. And without it, these cells, again, uh, cannot migrate. And again, this was mediated by uh, RAC because it was mimicked 
uh, by a, an increase in RAC activity. We wanted to look further at the dynamics of adhesions and migrating cancer cells. If you look here with me, these are um, breast cancer cells that were transfected with uh, GFP vinculin. You can see all of the different kinetics and all of the different adhesion structures. As the cells move forward, all of these big structures, big adhesion structures at the tail need to collapse. They need to leave so that the cells can pick up and move forward. But you can also see in higher resolution that at the leading edge of cells, there is this continuous dynamics, continuous formation of, of smaller uh, complexes that need to then coalesce together to form larger complexes that can support the weight of the cells and move them forward. This was very well characterized, but what was really interesting is that again, when Rho is inhibited, and you can see it through the focal adhesions, as opposed to the normal cells, the cells where Rho was inhibited, these couch potato cells, again, will round up on all sides, and they completely lost all of the different vari variations and sizes of focal adhesions and stuck with these tiny little dots that do not support the cell's weight to move forward. Again, we found this to be mediated through RAC, because when RAC was uh, overexpressed, the cells had the same phenotype, all of these structures all around and the uh, couch potato cells. So the pathway based on this data and many, many, many others is that RAC will lead to the creation of these tiny little dots, which is the beginning of adhesion. After that, these adhesion structures need to mature from these tiny little dots into larger adhesion structures that we call focal adhesions that you can see here. This uh, maturation requests uh, Rho to be active, so it's dependent on Rho. And we also found Rho and RAC to be antagonistic. So whenever we have, uh, so initially we need RAC, then it needs to, its activation needs to go down so that Rho can kick in and for these to mature into for the complexes to mature into adhesions. Okay, so the model is that as the cell is migrating, it will begin by forming these uh, focal complexes in green right here when a rack is active. And after that, uh, these complexes will mature into focal adhesions, which is mediated by Rho. So this is this step right here for the protrusion to adhere to the extracellular matrix for the cell to be able to pull itself forward. Now, after this work, um, uh, we became interested in a protein called STAR-D13 in the lab. What I didn't tell you is that these raw GTPs, including Rho and RAC, are um, inactive when uh, they are bound to GDP and are active when they are bound to GTP. And they do have regulators. So for them to activate, to go from GDP bound to GTP bound, these proteins need a protein called GAF that will activate them, but they also have inhibitors called GAPs, which will inhibit these raw GTPases. So in addition to inhibiting Rho, we started, we, we got interested in a protein called STAR-D13, which is an inhibitor for Rho. <clears throat> Uh, so, as I said, STAR-D13 is an inhibitor for Rho. So, when we knock down STAR-D13, as you would expect, we get an increase in the activation of Rho. We saw this by a pull-down assay, and we saw it using a, the FRET biosensor for Rho. So, but what was really interesting for us is that when we inhibited, when we knock down STAR-D13, so keep in mind that now we're going to have more active Rho, the cells, the cancer cells, and these are brain tumor cells here in this experiment, cancer cells were completely paralyzed. And the way they were paralyzed is they were completely, you see the tail of this cancer cell here, as the cell is trying to push away, that it will finally break, okay, and the cell is not able to move forward. So it's stuck in its place. So based on that, when we looked at the dynamics of flow activation in cell, when you, when you take a second look at that, you can see that Rho activation goes through cycles. So if you take each area aside and you look at it with time, you see that the activation goes up, then it goes down. 
So today we understand, and as opposed to a lot of older studies, which were kind of like, you know, end user kind of studies where they either inhibited or activated and tried to make a conclusion. Today we understand that when it comes to a lot of these proteins, because the cell migration is a cycle, a lot of these proteins need to activate and inactivate. So, so whether you're going to inhibit Rho or inhibit STAR-D13 keeping Rho active, it will lead to the same conclusion, which is that we're going to paralyze the cells. This is another way to look at it. Uh, so we're looking at migrating cells through the Rho biosensor. So again, you see this cell detaching its tail versus cells where study 13 is knocked down. We have too much Rho, too much active Rho at the tail, not allowing the focal adhesions to dissolve and not allowing the cells to move forward. Um, okay, so the, we have in the study 13 knockdown cells, the activation of Rho is just continuous. And the focal adhesions, if we look at the dynamics of focal adhesions, over time, you see that they form, then they dissolve in normal cells. But in the cells where star D13 was knocked down, there is this persistence of the focal adhesions, which again is leading to the paralysis of the cells. So now we have two models when it comes to cancer cell migration, one at the edge, which I showed before. But in addition to that, we have now what's happening at the tail of the cells, which is that you need to dissolve these uh, focal adhesions. So you need star D13 to kick in so that it will inhibit Rho A, uh, so that the focal adhesions can dissolve and the cell can pick itself and move forward. So this is the pretty much the last step uh, I told you about before in the cancer migration cycle. And also since then, uh, we did many, many, many other studies on star D13. Um, we looked at star D13 in lung cancer and ovarian cancer and prostate. This is uh, this was done by Leila Jafar, who established um, uh, 3D studies in the lab. She established the spheroids, and we looked at the role of star D13 as a tumor suppressor. Uh, Leila looked at the spheroids, and she looked at the size, the invasion emanating out of the steroids in uh, uh, these prostate cancer cells. So we've done a lot more characterization of STAR-D13 uh, since. I know time is almost up, so I'm going to uh, really hurry up here and just give you the spiel of this last part of the talk. Uh, so the last part is mostly data by uh, Isabel Fakhouri, a, a former postdoc in the lab, uh, Sandra Abdel-Latif, and Maria Al-Haddad, and it was done in uh, lung cancer and ovarian cancer as well. So after all of these studies, and throughout all of these studies, since we started looking at STAR-D13, since the days of uh, former student Basim Khalil, uh, former student Samer Hanna, all, uh, you know, uh, are currently postdocs in uh, very, you know, in Cornell and uh, Mount Sinai and Harvard and the US, um, uh, Sally Sitt, Anita Nasrallah, a lot of uh, these former students, uh, while they were studying star 13 we observed several times that when we knocked down star 13 we get an increase in invasion of cancer cells, which was completely contrast to what we saw in 2D. But it's quite understood in the field that what happens in 2D is not, doesn't necessarily translate in 3D, and I will explain to you why uh, in a little bit. So when we knocked down star 13 we saw an increase in invasion. So we now took, uh, we redirected our focus to invasion and uh, actin structures in 3D during invasion. Um, so we looked at star D13 and uh, it's uh, uh, how it, it's a gap, it's a, sorry, it's a gap for CDC42 as well, because we know that CDC42 plays a very central role in cancer cell invasion. So when we knock down star D13, uh, we have an increase in CDC42 activation as expected. This is a new biosensor, a new FRED biosensor that we were using in the lab. It was developed by, no for us, but it was developed by Samer Hanna and Einstein under Lewis Hodgson and Diane Cox in 2014. Okay, so uh, we started looking at CDC42 
and how they localize to this, these uh, uh, structures called invadopodia. Invadopodia are very similar to the protrusions in 2D, but they allow the cells to dig and go in 3D. So they are important for invasion. So we were able to see high activation of CDC42 and invadopodia. When we take stacks and using Confoco and stack the cells, we can see the localization to the substratum, which is where these invadopodia are supposed to be. I'm going to be done in like three or four slides, I promise. Uh, after that, when we uh, knocked down star D13, we were able to see, in addition to an increase in CDC42 activation, we were able to see an increase in the number of invadopodia when we stained for invadopodia using a protein called TKS4, which localizes to invadopodia. Uh, quantitating for the numbers of invadopodia was done by a macro developed by Zainab, Masri and Rayan Dernawi in the lab, they developed macros to uh, quantitate invadopodia and focal adhesions and ruffles and several others. Uh, when we looked at normal cells, normal cells do not have, as opposed to cancer cells, do not have invadopodia, but when we knocked down star D13 in normal cells, they began to develop invadopodia, which is what cancer cells use to invade as opposed to normal cells. Now, what was really interesting is that these invadopodia, while uh, they, you know, they show that we can stain them with TKS4 uh, again, they showed complete exclusion of star D13. So if you, when we stain for uh, star D13, we can see that at the site of um, staining for TKS4, which is where the invadopodia is, star D13 was completely lacking. And you can also see that CDC42 localizes to these invadopodia. CDC42 activation localizes to these invadopodia by FRET. And at these sites, when we do a matrix degradation assay, which was developed in the lab by Leila Jaffer, uh, we can see the decrease in signal, which reflects what these invadopodia are doing, which is that they are degrading the matrix. Here we use a fluorescently tagged matrix. Um, Okay, so uh, we were able to basically conclude that star D13 doesn't go to these invadopodia. It's excluded because CDC42 needs to be active there and star D13 needs to leave it alone and, and not to inhibit it. And CDC42 needs to be active there to drive the formation of these invadopodia. In a more recent study, we did uh, live movies to characterize the kinetics of these invadopodia. I'm sorry, my laser pointer is acting out. So you can see in the control cells here uh, that the invadopodia, they form, then they go away. And these are some stills reflecting that by time versus in cells where we knocked down star D13, these invadopodia really persisted throughout due to the lack of inhibition by uh, star D13. Um, we also showed that uh, when we stain for TKS5, we are staining for the early invadopodia. This was based on work done in the literature and that we were able to confirm in our lab. When we stain using uh, TKS4, we were able to show late invadopodia. So cells stained with TKS4 have matrix degradation, as you see here. Uh, with, these are the invadopodia that work, that are functioning, that are degrading the matrix. And these had a complete absence of star D13, as opposed to those early invadopodia that don't have matrix degradation ability. Some of them had star D13. Okay, so again, when we look at TKS4, which these are the mature invadopodia, there's complete lack of star D13 and there is a matrix uh, de uh, degradation ability. And again, when we look at TKS4, we see CDC42 activation by FRET. And if you look at star D13 and CDC42 activation by FRET, they are completely mutually exclusive. So we concluded that we have the early and the late invadopodia. Uh, in the early invadopodia, we might still see star D13 localizing there, but star D13 then needs to leave 
these early TKS4 positive in Vedopodia to allow for CDC42 to be active so that CDC42 can lead to the maturation of these structures and to matrix degradation. And so these are two models from two different papers, one in cell communication and signaling, one in the European Journal of Cell Biology that we just published in 2021. The first one talks about how the cancer cells will switch modalities so they can undergo either mesenchymal type of migration or when there's uh, no opportunity for that, they switch to what we call an amoeboid type invasion where the activation of CDC42 will kick in, invadopodia will be activated and the cells will invade. And further to that, we had a more detailed model in the latest paper showing how star D13 here and the star in this cartoon need uh, kicks in at the initiation of invadopodia, but then needs to leave so that CDC42 can be activated, leading to the activation of WASP and ARP2-3 and matrix metalloproteases, and so to the activation of the invadopodia itself. So I'm done with that. Uh, many, many, many people to thank, of course. The first two columns are, you know, all uh, the lab members uh, for years now, and I'm sure I forgot a couple and some volunteers. Uh, I'd like to again thank uh, Dr. Hermanani for the invitation today and the Dean for this wonderful uh, research seminar series. Uh, I, I really want to thank our uh, chair, Dr. Wax, who is uh, an incredibly patient person and keeping all of us sane and uh, keeping the labs open and functional. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues in the department, uh, particularly colleagues I've collaborated with over the years. Uh, I'd like to thank the lab supervisors, of course, and again, all the students. Uh, so again, today I showed work. Uh, pretty much everyone always, you know, chip in in anything that we do in the lab, really. So uh, Nora Ghazali, for example, she didn't, I didn't show data exactly or directly from her, but for years she had developed many, um, uh, you know, different assays in the lab. But in particular, today's work was by, uh, was established by Basim, Samer, Sali, was done by Dr. Fakhouri, by Maria Haddad, Sandra Abdul Latif, and uh, the macro, the, the matrix degradation was developed by Layla. Uh, the macro was developed by Zainab and a little bit by Rayan as well. Okay, and I'd like to thank, um, didn't show any work uh, uh, based on collaboration with these colleagues, but these are some collaborators from other institutions. And uh, our collaborators, uh, Louis Hodgson and Klaus Hahn, uh, with the support, of course, of the NIH grant that supports the production of these biosensors are absolutely instrumental for us to be able to do some of the microscopy that we do. And thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. So, um, thank yeah. you very much. I can take questions. Thank you. Either I can't hear you. No, I said uh, thank you, Mervat, and yes, we'll take questions. Any questions? Hmm. I I do have one. Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank Aida. you, Mirvat. Very interesting. Sorry, Joseph Masmata. Go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Ladies first. Uh, I have a very basic question. How can you tell the difference between a stage zero cancer and a tumor? If the only difference of classifying it as cancer, as you said, is that it's going to invade neighboring cells. So how do you know? No, okay. So wh when I say it, wh when I say it's the only still clinically acceptable distinction between benign and malignant, it's a very, very broad uh, clinically acceptable definition, let's say. But uh, I, always, uh, I always give this as an example, 
uh, in the class that when it comes to brain tumor, for example, brain tumor doesn't undergo metastasis, or for the longest time we thought it didn't undergo metastasis. And, you know, the field had many theories about that, maybe the blood brain barrier, but then people said, okay, but a lot of tumors would end up in the brain, so it's not the blood brain barrier. Then other people told me maybe, you know, the, the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system, but then turns out more recently we discovered that the brain does have a lymphatic system. And uh, uh, so, so really my, my own um, interpretation of it has always been that maybe unfortunately the patient doesn't live long enough for metastasis to manifest because we always have to think about our limitation in terms of detection. So a lot of the clinical things as we define them are how you're detecting them in the clinic. But when you think about the clinical detection, you have to think that we're very limited in terms of resolution. Yani around like six or seven years ago, two papers came out of Cornell that showed that breast cancer starts undergoing uh, metastasis from day one. So that really reversed wow. everything we know about the pro progression of cancer. But the idea is that, okay, fine, it does metastasize, but if it's only one cell, you're not going to detect it, okay? So so going back to your question, it's, it's you know, we know metastasis is horrible because now you have lost control. You, you don't know where to remove. You, you cannot have, clean, you know, clean margins in terms of surgical treatment. And we know how horrible chemotherapy is. I mean, no need to... And I always speak against chemotherapy, but then I said it's the least of all evils. It's the best we have, but it's horrible. Okay, but um, uh, so so invasion is still taking us to that next step of malignancy. But that's not to say that many tumors that don't invade or haven't invaded yet, or we haven't detected that yet, aren't terminal as well, such as the example of a brain tumor. And in that case, it's just because the tumor is in such a critical place. Right. So, I mean, you can have tumors grow in organs that aren't as critical uh, surface area wise compared to the brain. But but if a tumor is in the brain, of course, it's going to be malignant, whether it will invade or not. Did I answer your question? Hey, very elaborately. Thank you, Mirvat. <laughs> There are a lot of fascinating things in this talk, and one of the most fascinating things actually is how fast the technology, the imaging technology is evolving. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, take Thank you. Uh, Slaimane is asking in the chat, so a lot of the cells that we have, Slaimane, uh, these are cells that you get as cell lines, so, so they are commercial cell lines. A lot of uh, tumor tissues, I uh, I mentioned Najla Fakhreddin and Noha Bajani, for example. I started collaborating with pathologists from day one and, and Salim Nasir. And we collected many, many, many tumor tissues over the years. But really for those we just use for immunohistochemistry, but we don't use to uh, for the imaging that I showed. Uh, and other agents, a lot of biosensors, constructs, plasmids, uh, these come from the collaborators I mentioned. And, you know, other than that, uh, you know, common reagents, uh, we purchase them through the department here locally. And we have Joseph. Joseph? Yep. So thank you very much, Mirat, for this um, amazing talk with a lot of, you know, information. So my question is, um, you have mentioned about crosstalk of raw yeah. GTPAs. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the PTM crosstalk when it comes to cancer briefly? Did you check this, for example, if there is any activation due to certain phosphorylation or other type of PTM that can act on those, uh, you know, important, you know, protein actors in your in your in your uh, in your case in this case? And uh, one more question regarding: uh, you said um, when you inhibit Rho pathway, uh, this indicated that Rho is important, in fact, for cancerous, uh, you know, cells. Uh, so, is there any, let's say, a drug design project that is running currently with? Uh, you know, future application of using these type of inhibitors to treat cancer in the future. Thank you very much, Mirbet. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, so there are uh, clinical um, uh, Y27632, which is the ROC inhibitor, which is downstream from Rho. There's already clinical studies on that. Okay, so so that's already in the clinics. Um, for, uh, I'm gonna say, um, so there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of uh, potential drugs to inhibit these pathways. 
others uh, to inhibit PI3 kinase, uh, which I didn't talk about, which is upstream from these pathways. But there's always the issue, whenever it comes to these pathways, there's the issue that uh, these pathways are very important for normal cells as well. And as we know, when you talk about migration, as I mentioned, migration is needed for the immune system, it's needed for uh, wound healing. So, so uh, you'd end up with the same issues that you have with chemotherapy, that you inhibit a lot, of, if you inhibit a lot of these pathways in normal cells as well, you would have the same side effects you would usually have with chemotherapy. This is why the work of some colleagues who study migration in immune cells or cells of hematopoietic lineage in general, like Diane Cox and others, is so important because it shows distinction between migration in cancer versus normal cells. And if we can find distinction, we can target that uh, distinction. Okay, so, but, but, you know, having said that, yes, um, there, there are some uh, clinical trials. And uh, this is, uh, your question is really excellent because this is exactly why I wanted to study the gap, the study 13, uh, because as opposed to potentially inhibiting Rho in general or CDC, if you inhibit CDC42, the cells die. Right? And this is why we don't have mass animal models for that or CDC42. It would be embryonic lethal. So these are proteins important for many, many, many things in the cells, including proliferation, survival, many things. But the regulators of these proteins are specific. So star 13 we saw it to localize only to focal adhesions. And we saw it to, this is why we're honing in on these regulators, because then you can be more uh, targeted. Um, Hella, your first question when it comes to phosphorylation, all of these signal transduction pathways work by phosphorylation. So these raw GTPs, is they, they get loaded with GTP, but all the pathways upstream, downstream, PI3 kinase, for example, is a lipid kinase, it phosphorylates, uh, AKT leads to phosphorylate. So we have so many phosphorylating events throughout the pathways, a lot of come in, you know, um, uh, proteomics was done on that. So, so yeah, phosphorylation is implicated, uh, you know, in uh, phosphatyrosines, for example, uh, are created on the cytoplasmic uh, sides of the receptor tyrosine kinases, which is uh, what fires a lot of these actin polymerization events to begin with. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mirvaz. Thank you. Any other question? Siba. Yes, doctor. Thank you for this talk. Um, I have a question. So you're saying that the uh, star D13 as a regulator of CD42 is only present in the invadopodia. It's not present in the cell, other places in the cell. So when, when we stained for STAR-D13, very, very few people actually are working on STAR-D13. I think we're the only ones who are working on STAR-D13 in migration. There was one Japanese group that was working on it, but the guy retired. And so no one's really looking at STAR-D13 in terms of uh, localization. It's also called the LC2, the, that same protein. Uh, we found it to localize to these uh, to focal adhesions, okay, and to be excluded from invadopodia. But it seems to uh, and and to, to localize to some TKS5 positive uh, structures, but it doesn't seem to have a, a you know diffuse type uh, localization. And so far, its function has been mostly linked to CDC42 and Rho A. And when you look at the different domains, it doesn't really have a lot more you know uh, 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 potentially interesting functions. Because the domains are are mostly implicated in the regulation of Rho A and CDC42, so hopefully, um, you know it's uh, it's it's specific enough. And so far, when we knock it down, the cells don't die, don't do other things. Uh, okay, so so we're able to really limit the side effects. But this is still uh, in culture. This is still and we haven't really done it in vivo yet. We haven't done. Uh, start the 13 lockdowns in vivo. Okay, thank you. So it's considered as um, a targeted uh, protein for this path. I'm hoping. Maybe, yeah. Okay. I can't thank say till till we do it in, in animals and, and right. animals don't die. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, comments for the, 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 the surviving? 
Okay. If no other questions, ah, so ah, Dean is back. Go ahead, Dean. Hello, I think I fixed my audio now. Hello. Your audio and visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, no, I was listening. I just couldn't speak. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sibari. What a fascinating talk and so much meaningful engagement from the audience. Thank you everybody for your meaningful questions and the thorough responses uh, of Dr. Sibari. This uh, brings to an end our series of uh, research uh, talks for the spring semester. Uh, please join us again as soon as you see that we have launched a new series of research seminars. Thank you for all of my faculty for all your efforts in research, uh, despite everything that's going on around us and the limitations in research. I'm going to wish you a happy and sunny Friday, and I look forward to seeing you next week at the faculty meeting if you have time to join us. Goodbye, everybody, for now.